Just ahead, there's another edition of the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. I'm political commentator Al Spry. We have a very interesting guest on the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, talking about the two great leaders who uh, brought the war to a close. Historian William C. Davis, who uh, I believe to be probably the preeminent historian of the Civil War of our time, is going to talk about the crucible of command, Grant and Lee. Stay put. The Florida Roundtable begins following these messages. This is the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. I'm political analyst uh, Al Spry. It's great to be here with you, Reagan, on our 80 stations across the Florida network and uh, also on Tough TV 38. Uh, we appreciate all the support we get uh, on television as well. Check them out, Tough TV 38. You can... Uh, Get them HD in Orlando. Also, you can uh, grab them uh, uh, on certain cable companies as well. Yeah. And if you uh, if you want to get it uh, on your cable company or your satellite company, uh, let people know about Tough TV and Tough TV 38. And we guarantee you that Al and I, our image does not break your screen. So no, I, I, <laughs> at least it hasn't yet. <laughs> I shaved this morning. I uh, quaffed my hair there properly for the uh, for uh, the event. So that's good. All right. Well, uh, Jeb Bush, uh, I guess he's in the race. Has he even announced? Not or is officially. It just, or is it's, it just it's, it's kind of assumed? The formation of that committee, I guess, but pushing him in that direction, yeah. And now, but they're already calling him, the press likes to call him the front runner, but he's mm. nowhere near being the front runner. We no. have a Scott Walker, you know, from Wisconsin. We have a Marco Rubio here in Florida. Uh, uh, but... Uh, the I think, uh, and according to this article here from Politico, the Republican nomination is wide open. I I, th- I would agree with that. You know, there, some of them are in double digits, most of them in single digits, but nobody with even close to having a, a majority or even a quarter of the support of the party. Uh, so uh, I, I think it is way too early to be talking about uh, anointing somebody as the front runner already. Well, and, you know, the name Bush, uh, mixed blessings, right? Uh, do we really want to deal with another Bush or, by that uh, matter, another Clinton? Uh, don't you think the people are, are getting a little uh, tired of the brand? You know, and, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Bush 43, George W., uh, recently made a speech uh, in which he talked about Jeb having a problem. And his answer to the problem was, me, yeah. You know, <laughs> sure. and of course, he went to a great extent to say, I am not my brother and we're separate men and all that. But he acknowledged, the, as you're saying, another Bush. I know, but we have 535 members of Congress. We have 50 governors. Is this is this the best that the United States can do? That's something that well, people have to ask themselves. Yeah, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just no, asking. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. There's, th- there's 300 million people out there. And all we can do is come up with another Bush and another Clinton. I mean, out of 300 million? You know, at <laughs> least you have, uh, you know, Rubio is, uh, is, is a guy who likes to shake things up. He, he got the uh, nomination for Senate and then won when everyone thought, including us, Charlie oh, Chris Charlie pretty Chris much was had a, a, shoe in, a yeah. lock on it. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and then the demographics of the United States are changing. There are many more Hispanics, and uh, they are forming a larger and larger uh, percentage of uh, eligible voters. And if uh, Rubio can come across as the Hispanic solution candidate, uh, maybe he really has a, a t- quite a chance to win. You know, nobody uh, nobody's ever asked Charlie Crist if he regrets having named an interim U.S. senator when Mel Martinez retired instead of appointing himself to the seat so that he would have already had it and been the incumbent. <laughs> and that's been done before. You know, a lot of governors have done that. I'm name myself to the seat. He wanted it, and the other guy was going to step aside. No, I've never heard anybody ask Charlie if he's sorry he did that. Oh, I'm sure he, I'm sure he is because he's out of politics now. Yeah. There's no real way for him back in, I don't think. No. If he ran again, he would just look like a, ta- a laughing stock. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, lost opportunities, but, uh, Jeb Bush, you know, uh, it's, it's like I said, it's wide open. Ted Cruz, I don't really think has a shot. 
Um, but uh, Scott Walker has a shot. Jeb Bush has a shot. Rubio has a very good shot. I think it could be a Rubio Walker ticket or a Walker Rubio ticket. I don't know if it's Bush's figures into it. I guess we'll have to see. Number one, if he actually runs, he hasn't declared yet. I, and I think that you are in agreement with a number of uh, Florida analysts, at least, who really feel like Marco Rubio is not out there actually angling for the presidential nomination for himself, but rather to make a decent showing and be a vice presidential prospect, a young man, and a presidency could be years down the road if, in fact, he would become the vice president of the United States. So we'll watch and see. The primaries are going to be on us before we know it. That's for sure. Unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right. Well, let us pause along the network line. We'll remind you that this is the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and of Tough TV 38. We'll continue in a moment. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And Al, as promised, uh, our very special guest for this segment of the program is William Charles Davis. William C. Davis, an American historian, professor of history, a Virginia Tech uh, uh, at, at director of programs at the school's Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. Uh, Bill Davis has specialized in the American Civil War for many years now. He's got many books out, and I, I don't think that I would be stretching a point to say that William C. Davis is the preeminent Civil War historian of our time. And uh, uh, Bill, welcome to the Florida Roundtable. Hi, I'm delighted to be with you. Well, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to have you, sir. And the, the occasion of our visit is a brand new book that you have out uh, entitled Crucible of Command, Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee, The War They Fought, The Peace They Forged. It's from our friends at DeCapo Press. And, and here we are. It's 150 years since the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia by Robert E. Lee to, to Ulysses Grant. Uh, literally billions of words have been written, um, and yet you have broken new ground. And I, I, I guess the first question I have to ask you is, w what motivated you? How did you go searching after 150 years and, and, and billions of words? Uh, where did this idea come from? Uh, the, well, the idea actually came from my wife, who was in an audience once when I was doing some questions and answers, and I just got started comparing Grant and Lee, uh, their personalities, their sort of ethical and moral codes, and she thought that might be an interesting topic for a book. The, um, the research itself, I think most historians would agree, is the real fun. Writing is sort of the necessary work you've got to do afterwards to give your research any point. And I've, I really enjoy getting into old things, especially like newspapers, which are uh, often much ignored uh, sources, and uh, manuscripts that turn up in private hands. Collectors have an awful lot of stuff that historians ordinarily can't get at because it's not in an archive someplace where you can find it in a card catalog. So I really, that's really where I found most of the new material that's in the book. Much of the rest of it is simply a new look at material that's been around for quite a while to see if the story to draw out of it might not be different than what people have done before. Why is it, uh, after 150 years, that the, the topic of the Civil War is still as compelling a topic as ever? Well, a whole host of reasons. It's, it's, the, the interest was kept alive by the veterans for, for two generations after the war and then kept alive by their children. Uh, the whole notion of the underdog, in this case the Confederacy, has a natural appeal for Americans, at least if not for people around the world. And uh, those, many of the issues are, are, are still with us. There are unresolved issues from it. Uh, at the same time, you can't, you can't live in America, especially east of the Mississippi River, without running into it all the time. Every courthouse has a Union or Confederate soldier on the courthouse lawn with a the federal, state, even local battlefields that uh, people pass, the names on highways and schools, and it's, it's completely interwoven into our culture in the way no other experience in our past has been. And so that people understand uh, how formidable this is, that if we count up the dead on both sides uh, in, in this particular four-year period, 
it outnumbers the com the combined deaths of every other war this country has ever been in. Right. And we've been in a lot of wars. Yes. <laughs> we have. We have. <laughs> the uh, the uh, accepted number for a long time was about 680,000 dead. Then that got revised up to about 700,000. But that figure keeps going up. Uh, some estimates are now that when you count the men who died a year, two years, five years after the war because of war wounds, the total probably exceeds a million. Wow. That's and a lot of men. To, to have an idea of the impact of that, if we were in a conflict today and we suffered losses in proportion to the losses suffered during the Civil War, we'd have about 10 to 12 million dead. That's now, the entire population of a small state. Yeah. Now, let's, uh, let's kind of get to the gist of, of this very interesting book. Uh, I remember when I was studying Civil War history where you uh, read McPherson, and he had a lot of nice things to say about it. Uh, and... Uh, you have these two monumental generals, more well-known than most of the generals that have come through the United States uh, military. Uh, two uh, different men, but similar in a lot of ways. Uh, let's give a brief rundown on each and kind of get people familiar with them. Well, Robert E. Lee's born in 1807. He's the son of a Revolutionary War hero, Light Horse Henry Lee, who many Americans have still heard of. His uh, father was unfortunately very bad with handling money and his personal life and wound up in debtor's jail and eventually left the country, essentially abandoned his family when Robert E. Lee was about uh, about seven years old. He had to be the man of the house, which really had a big impact on the kind of man he became, a very contained, very controlled, devoted to duty, uh, because he was taking care of his mother and his, daughter, his uh, sisters. He went to West Point, where he had a stellar career, though not, as myth would have it, um, a unique one. It's often been said that Lee's the only man who ever finished at West Point with no demerits. That's not true. Uh, in his own class, there were five or six others who graduated with no demerits. It was not that uncommon. He didn't spent much of the next 30 years of his life in the uh, peacetime U.S. Army and, of course, in the war with Mexico until by 1860. One, he was colonel of the cavalry regiment and feeling like his life had been pretty much a failure. Then along came the war, and he had to make the choice of um, staying in Union Blue or giving up that career that he had loved to become a Confederate. U.S. Grant's a very different sort of fellow. He's 15 years younger, grew up out on the what was then called the, the Northwest in Ohio, uh, grew up in the wealthiest house in town, though they weren't rich, but they were very well off. Uh, not much of a student, a fellow who never let uh, studies get in the way of having a good time. He went to West Point and had a pretty average career, and then a number of years in the peacetime army, then he resigned and uh, came back home, where he kind of failed at pretty much everything until by 1861 he was working in his father's uh, leather goods store in Galena, Illinois, and had no real future prospects until the war suddenly appeared. That's very interesting, uh, the dynamic there. Uh, these, these men uh, felt like failures. That's an interesting point. Uh, uh, why do you think that was? Well, in Lee's case, I think he felt like a failure all the way around. It was something in his, in his personality. By 1861, he felt he'd not been a good father, he'd not been a good husband, that his, uh, he had not made friends in his life. He felt isolated and almost alone. Uh, he... Uh, felt like his professional career, though he'd risen very high so in terms of the old army, he still really felt like he probably should have done something else with his life. Um, and, and Lee, by that time, is a very serious, uh, sober sort of fellow who's taken on also a, a, a sort of a brand of Christianity that we would call providentialism, in which uh, he felt that he and man in general were completely helpless. They were just sort of tools of God, and you went from one misfortune in life to the other until finally you, you got lucky and you died, and all the misery ended, and then you went to heaven. <laughs> it's not a real happy outlook on life. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to digress for just a second here, because I recently was in Savannah, Georgia, uh, and, and went to see... Uh, Fort Pulaski, which is now a national monument, a national park right. and whatnot. And I found myself, you know, reading the plaques and realizing that this fort, in large part, was laid out under the direction 
of a guy named Robert E. Lee. That's right. Uh, so it, it, it is still with us. As you say, you can't hardly go anywhere without bumping into these things. Uh, no, you can't. His, his, his touch, uh, especially uh, throughout this area, uh, is, 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 lo- is huge. He did a great deal of work at Fort Pulaski. That was one of his earliest assignments after he got out of West Point. He did a lot of work at uh, Fort Monroe uh, in Virginia. He helped to control the uh, the course of the Mississippi River at St. Louis uh, for a time. He he was an engineer. All the, all the men who finished in the top of the class at West Point became engineers, and so he 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 had a lot of influence, and he's left a lot of marks on the land. You know. Uh and again, I kind of digress, and maybe I, I should have asked this up front. But this is this is a, a very large volume. Uh, this is not one that you pick up and read in an hour and a half. You you have to. Yeah, it invest. may not get a lot of airports. <laughs> you have to uh, in, invest some time in this crucible of command. But it uh, to me, it is a marvelous read. And uh, but I have to say, and, and, and uh, for the sake of our audience along the network line here, why should people care about Grant and Lee and their lives being intertwined? Oh, a number of reasons. I think first of all, uh, solely aside from the fact that they're simply interesting characters, uh, they were the most popular men in their respective countries in their time. By 1865, Grant was much more popular than Lincoln in the North. Lee is much more popular than Jefferson Davis in the South. The The way they ended the war it probably has still had more lasting influence that, uh, that people ought to be aware of today. It, Grant did not want anything like a ceremony or in sort, any sort of big celebration. He preferred just to meet Lee by himself and handle the surrender without any notoriety without anything that might be embarrassing or humiliating to Lee and his uh, his soldiers, believing that the easier he made the surrender, the easier it would be for the southern states to to segue back into the Union. Um, Lee's dignity is, is still a marvelous um, example for how people can deal with severe stress and still emerge with pride. Things could have been somewhat different if Grant had pursued a harsh policy, intending to defeat Lee in detail and just you know, wipe out his army. But but he didn't. Uh, it, it's easy to romanticize Appomattox. In our the anniversary course was just a week before last. But in fact, it did set a tone that Americans North and South frequently aspired to, even if they didn't always achieve it. Now, I tell you what, we're, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a pause along our network line here uh, for uh, our stations to uh, ring the cash register, as it were. <laughs> but uh, let us remind folks that they are listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. And in the Orlando area, we are seen three times a week on TV 38 on Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday morning at 9. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest is historian William C. Davis. He is the author of a brand new book from DeCapo Press, Crucible of Command, Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, The War They Fought, The Peace They Forged. We are observing the 150th anniversary of the end of the American Civil War, the costliest war in terms of lives that this country has ever been involved in. It is a marvelous piece of history. Uh, and, and it is a wonderful read. So we hope that you will stay put because our conversation with Bill Davis continues in a moment. From Pensacola to Key West and all points in between, you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is historian William C. Davis. He is the author of Crucible of Command. It is a a story of Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee, the Civil War, the peace that was forged from our friends at DeCapo Press. Uh, That should be available at all the fine bookstores uh, all over Florida and places like Amazon.com. And... Bill, uh, one of the things you do is is debunk some of the myths that evolved uh, about these two men over the years. And one of them uh, that perhaps surprised me a little bit, uh, Ulysses S. Grant has always been portrayed uh, at least as a younger man who had had an affinity for the bottle that he had. He had a severe alcohol problem. Uh, Tell us about that. 
It's, it's one of the most prevailing myths. Indeed, if you were to ask any American today what they know about U.S. Grant, they would know that he was at Appomattox and that he was a drunk. <laughs> oh, no. It's all <laughs> boiled down to that, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, Grant's not, Grant was not an alcoholic. He, there's by no means of definition was he an alcoholic. He simply didn't have any of the symptoms that are classically associated with alcoholism. He was a fellow, like uh, many people, all of us know, uh, a fellow who couldn't handle alcohol. So just two or three drinks could make him a little silly. And there are maybe four, perhaps five uh, documented occasions during the war when he did just really get drunk. Uh, Usually they were at times when there was nothing much going on uh, with the war in the field. And the interesting thing about him is that he would go to bed, sleep it off, and wake up feeling great the next morning and go right back to work. He didn't even seem to have hangovers. Hmm. But this whole business about him being an alcoholic really got started out of out of jealousy. Uh, uh, Grant had arrested a... It takes too long to explain the whole thing, but Grant offended a steamboatman by arresting him on good cause, and the steamboatman immediately started creating these stories about Grant being an alcoholic, the stories that got to a man named John McClernand, who was a fellow a politician from Illinois who became a general, and he thought he ought to have Grant's command. So McClernand began spreading these stories through the press so that by 1863, uh, the, the McClur- pro-McClernand press had spread these stories across the country. They didn't take much traction at the time, but after the war, they were quickly adopted by former Confederates, as they crafted what's known to historians as the lost cause myth. And, you know, it's bad enough to be beaten, but it's even worse if you're beaten by somebody who's really good. And so they, the myth sort of attributes Confederate defeat to overwhelming numbers on the part of the Union and not skill that Grant was an alcoholic who just got lucky and simply beat them down with, with uh, overwhelming might. But it is still a, uh, a powerful and, and persistent myth to this day. Mm-hmm. What do you say to people that uh, come up with that uh, theory? I, I, I try to briefly, um, well, I, if I give them the full story, I bore the devil out of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 pretty much what I just said, I try to briefly indicate that it's something that grew up out of jealousy upon the part of, of his opponents with a small grain of truth in it. Most myths will have some small percentage of truth that's been greatly magnified to suit their purposes or someone else. So what would you say the reason that the North beat the South was, in, in your learned opinion? Well, I think it's, it's overwhelming. There's no question there's overwhelming resources, uh, which certainly helped. Uh, the North was fortunate to have its best commander, Grant, out in what was called the Western Theater of the War, that is the area between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, where geography helped the Union to defeat the Confederacy by carving it up into small pieces Mm -hmm. using gunboats on its rivers. And, of course, it is Grant who inaugurates and pursues that that policy. And the North had the will to stick with it. Most Confederates knew they were beaten, I think, the, the ones who were thinking really knew they were beaten in November 1864 when Lincoln was reelected to the presidency. Their hope at that point had been that a pro-peace faction of the Democratic Party would uh, defeat Lincoln and would then be willing just to end the war and let the Confederate states go rather than to continue to pay the price. But when the northern people uh, pretty overwhelmingly re-elected Lincoln, that was a, a fire bell in the night to the Confederates that they were going to have to face four more years that they simply didn't have the manpower or the material wherewithal to, to continue. One of the myths that has grown up around Robert E. Lee, and and I, I think that over the course of your book, you expose this uh, on a gradual basis, almost as it really happened, and that is uh, that Robert E. Lee never actually hated the Yankees. Uh, and and to use the word myth with that, to tell us that story. Yeah, I, I don't know where that one grew up, though it is a part of the lost cause myth that, that Lee is this magnanimous um, uh, gentle man inside who sort of has Christ-like uh, attributes and isn't really mortal. Uh, in the early days, he didn't really hate the, the Yankees. In fact, it would be so surprised most people that uh, 
I think by May, even June of 1861, after he's become a Confederate general, he still harbors some hopes that the two sections might be able to reunite as one again if the southern states could get some guarantees of, of uh, rights of property and slavery and then the right to take slave property into the new territories. But by 18, early 1863, I think he's seen enough killing. He's suffered enough personal loss, both in his family and his military family, to begin to resent the enemy. And then really by mid-1863 and on, he comes to increasingly just detest them. And there's an old myth that he never referred to Yankees as the enemy. That's just complete nonsense. He does it all the time. He refers to them as vile, as villainous, as a hateful race, as if he views Northerners as a separate race from Southerners. And by, 18, by 1865, he actually feels that, that in some way the, the Union is personally out to get him because of the damage it's done to his, his family. Well, the, uh, that was his natural reaction. I say that was his property. Uh, what became uh, the uh, Arlington National Cemetery was uh, was Lee's property, right? Well, it was his wife's property. Yeah, it was never his. Mm -hmm. But uh, once his wife died, it was to go to his his oldest son, Custis. You know, there's a wonderful irony that when Grant died in 1885, there was a movement to bury him at Arlington. How's that for? Uh, for <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, it mm. uh, and and of course that's related to Washington. That goes back to the Washington family, right? Right. Uh, Lee's wife Mary was the uh, um, granddaughter of, uh, or the, the daughter of Washington's adopted son, George Washington Park Custis. Uh, Bill, some of the traits that make these two men great leaders, in your estimation, one that they have that they both shared, I think is uh, that nothing really flummoxed them very much. Both of them, when confronted with a surprise or a setback, unlike so many other generals on both sides in that war who would, would retreat to regroup and then replan and come forward again, Grant and Lee have exactly the same response. Their instinct is to say, well, that's not good, but now what can I do to turn this to my advantage? How do I keep going forward? That's a vital. That's a vital component, I think, in any successful, not just general, but any leader or executive. They planned well. They kept cool heads. They were innovative, and they were very bold. They're very daring. They took enormous chances. These are men who can, rather like Harry Truman, the night before the bomb was dropped, he can take a huge risk, and then they can go to bed, get a good night's sleep. Yeah, they. In other words, uh, they they were very stoic uh, folks. They're stoic and they're untroubled by responsibility, mm -hmm. which you see time and time again among other army commanders in that war is just crippling in some mm -hmm. cases. Going back to a remark that you made earlier, though, along those lines, uh, Grant could be called an incurable optimist. And yet Lee had that more fatalistic and pessimistic uh, outlook on his personal life. Talk about that. Yeah, uh, Grant really is a guy who gets up every morning expecting something good to happen. Even in his earlier life, when one of his enterprises fails, he just starts something else, and he always expects to win. It's also a very necessary uh, quality in a commander. Lee's, that, that providentialism of Lee's in which you know, he feels like he's helpless and that everything he does or the man does is, is up to God, in a way, was liberating because that meant he could try almost anything, and if God meant for it to succeed, it would. And if it didn't succeed, well, it was God's will and, and not Lee's uh, mistake. So in a way, though these have two very opposite attitudes in that regard, they kind of lead to the same end, which is, is, is quite audacious. Uh, Bill, uh, once again, we're going to have to take a little bit of a pause along our network line here. We'll remind the folks that they are listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks, and in the Orlando area on T Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is historian William Davis. His brand new book, Crucible of Command, Ulysses Grant and Robert Lee, The War They Fought, The Peace They Forged. It's from our friends at DeCapo Press. Uh, should be available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. It is the 150th anniversary of the end of that war. And if you'll stay put, 
Our conversation will continue following these messages. This is the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in Orlando on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And our very special guest this day is historian William C. Davis. His book, From De Capo Press, Crucible of Command. And, Bill, thank you for spending all of this time with us today. Uh, before we have to run away, I want you to talk about the aftermath of the war. Now, Robert E. Lee only lived for five years after the end of the war. Grant went on to become the president. But the, the war and, and it determined their futures as, as leaders. Uh, tell us about that. Oh, very much so. Uh, Grant was already being spoken of as a possible presidential candidate in late 1863 and 1864. Uh, he was so popular as a general. And, in fact, Lincoln was hesitant to appoint Grant general-in-chief until he had an assurance that Grant didn't intend to run against him for the presidency. Wow. Uh, at, that, at that period, Grant had no interest whatever in, in politics or in being president. But uh, rather like Eisenhower at the end of World War II, as I said, Grant was the most popular man in the country. Uh, the Lincoln successor, Andrew Johnson, was a horrible failure who was pretty much on the verge of giving away the store to the ex-Confederates. And... Um, when Grant was approached by the Republican Party, there was almost no way he could say no. Uh, he's a much more successful president than he's been given credit. He's really, in terms of social issues, probably the first president to really attack things that we think of social issues until the 20th century. Uh, his foreign policy was not all that great, but he tried to better the condition of American Indians. He tried to ensure that the 15th Amendment, as well as the 13th and 14th, were observed to the letter of the law to provide rights to the former slaves. He's a fairly innovative guy. Uh, Lee, on the other hand, is dead broke at the end of the war. He has no property. He doesn't own a thing except the clothes on his back and really doesn't know what to do. For, for a few months, he'll actually live as an unpaying guest in a cottage that belongs to a cousin. He's offered a great many figurehead presidencies, presidents of, uh, presidencies of insurance companies, railroad companies, everybody in the South and even some of the North trying to capitalize on his name. But he turns them down because he doesn't regard that as a dignified um, way to use his time or his name. And then along came the request from Washington College, which was pretty much in a bad way at the end of the war asking him to come be president and try to rebuild the college. And that, of course, is what he does that helps to produce what's today known as Washington and Lee University. And Lee is, a, in, fine, in, in actuality, a fine educator, as it turns out. Let's uh, talk about uh, the last meeting between uh, the two great mm -hmm. leaders that, of course, are the subject of your book. They, they actually only meet four times that we know of, once in Mexico, which Lee never remembered and Grant never forgot, which I think is interesting. Then they met April 9th at Appomattox. They had a brief meeting the next day, April 10th. And then when Grant uh, moved into the White House in March of 1869, one of the first guests he invited was Robert E. Lee. He sent him through an intermediary or invitation to call on him at the White House. And Lee actually comes in April. It's a it's an uncomfortable meeting for both of them. They're, they're not comfortable with, in each other's company, but uh, they're polite. Uh, Grant was hoping, realizing that Lee is the most popular man of the South and certainly Virginia, he's hoping that Lee might be willing to speak out publicly in favor of a revised constitution for Virginia and a moderate candidate for governor, uh, both of whom were going to affirm uh, allegiance to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And Grant thought that if Lee did that in Virginia, that other states might follow suit. And in fact, though Lee supported both the new Constitution and that gubernatorial candidate, he simply couldn't bring himself to speak out in public. Lee abhorred the press. He never wanted to appear in the newspapers or to speak out publicly. So he politely declined and, and then left. And that was, the, uh, that was the last time they ever met. It's an interview that took maybe a little less than an hour. I love the way you described it in the book, that there were all these senators and congressmen and people in the outer office waiting yeah. to get in to see President Grant, and General Lee is swept past all of them, and they're looking at him like, well, who the hell is that, that he gets to go first, <laughs> you know? There's a lot of grumbling. You've let the damn rebel go in in front of us. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Bill, what, what do you want people to take away from your book, The Crucible of Command? I, I think, first of all, especially maybe for historians, to realize that the story's never finished. We, no matter how hard we look at research, we never find more than maybe 40 or 50 percent of, of what we need to put together a story. And if you keep looking harder, there's always something new to find. And there's a lot that's new in this book. But much beyond that, I, I think, the, as I said, these are the two most popular men of their time. Uh, and uh, Lee especially still has millions of Americans who revere him to this day. Uh, he's, I'm, I'm not joking when I say he's often compared to Christ, especially in Virginia, where I live. That we, are, If we're going to make heroes of people, we ought to understand more about them and find out what it is that's deserving of our empathy and our emulation, as well as to discover that they were, in fact, real men. If we can forgive their shortcomings, we can, we can forgive our own. They, uh, their, their story is, is simply marvelous. Our, our culture is stuck with them. We can never get rid of them, even if we want to. So the more and better we understand them, I think, the better off we are as Americans with an understanding of our, our culture. Very well said. The book is Crucible of Command, Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, The War They Fought, The Peace That They Forged. It's by historian William C. Davis. It's from our friends at DeCapo Press. It uh, should be available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. And, uh, Bill, thank you so much for spending all of this time with us today. We know you're uh, on tour and a very busy man. So, But we do hope that when the next one's ready, you'll come back and do this again. I'd be delighted. It's been great fun. Thank you. William C. Davis. You are listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And uh, we hope you have enjoyed uh, this portion of the conversation, as have as much as Al and I have. Uh, and we will be back with a closing thought following these messages. <laughs> We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. And uh, I enjoyed that conversation with Bill Davis, uh, Al, uh, 150 years since the Civil War is over, and he's actually found fresh material and, and, and uh, new angles to, to put on a story that's fairly well known. It was a fun conversation. Yeah. Let's uh, turn to uh, this abortion bill. Senate proposal require women to wait at least 24 hours before having an abortion. And, and let's, let's say up front, it is the Florida Senate we're talking yes, about. Yes, Florida not the, Senate. Not the United States. This is the GOP who says that government should stay out of people's lives, by the way. Yeah. I always like to make that point because uh, that doesn't apply in every case. And when people say, yes, but we're protecting the unborn, but, you know, it's not really a child until it's born. Uh, my, when my wife had a miscarriage, uh, we didn't have a funeral, and it's not listed that I had a child or anything right. like that. Right. So right. Uh, I think that uh, government should stay out of people's lives as much as possible, especially those from a party who claim to uh, be for that. Uh, so now they're uh, putting in an amendment to waive the uh, waiting period for pregnancies that are the result of rape or incest. Me, I don't know what the difference is if you're going to cover it. You know, if you're going to go one way, go one way. If you're going to go another way, another way. Uh, or maybe just scrap the whole thing and just uh, leave uh, women alone to uh, get through a difficult decision on their own. What do you think, Reagan? I, I agree with you, Al. And I, you know, I think back uh, when this was a, a larger issue on the national stage, uh, Ronald Reagan used to talk about, just like you did, uh, rape, incest, the mother's life is endangered. Uh, and, and they used those specific guidelines, and, and it seems as though we have degenerated into all sorts of nitpicking, and, and uh, something's gotten lost here. Well, you know, honestly, I think we should just uh, uh, give people freedom to do what they wish as much as possible in this country, uh, and if it's uh, getting an abortion, then that's a right that they have, uh, as guaranteed by the decision of Roe v. Wade, and until that is changed, uh, that is the law of the land, and all this nitpicking on, uh, you know, what's included and what shouldn't be included, what's this and what's that is just a distraction uh, from other issues that are more important, like jobs, yep. like uh, growing the economy, yep. like giving everybody opportunity to, uh, to live the American dream. Uh, instead, we always find uh, politicians playing politics with uh, important issues. And thus it is. Well, it is time for us to say thank you for your time this day. We hope you have enjoyed the conversation. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And we will be back with another edition of the Florida Roundtable in one week. <laughs>
You've been listening to Florida Roundtable, a weekly look at issues and problems of concern to Floridians from a state, national, and international perspective. Presented by the Florida News Network with your hosts, Reagan Smith and Al Spry. The views and opinions expressed during the preceding program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily those of this station's ownership, management, or sponsors of FNN. Your views and opinions are welcome. Address your card or letter to Florida Roundtable in care of Reagan Smith. 2500 Maitland Center Parkway, Suite 407, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Or you may email reagansmith at fnnonline.com. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week for another edition of Florida Roundtable.